Thank you so much for your questions, lots of really good questions, uh, and some indeed along various themes. So we're going to try and group some of the questions under some of those uh, common themes. Please forgive us if we're not able to deal with all the questions. So many came through, through texting and also written. Uh, very good questions. I think we begin to get, w want to get out of the way the one that you told us all to ask. What are uncontrollable emotions, Tim? Uh, it give you a an example would be uh, two women that I counseled not the very same year, but close enough to one another, uh, both of whom had uh, one child, a son, teenage son, um, who, and in both cases, the sons were go doing bad things, trouble in school, trouble with the law. And the reason was the fathers, her, you know, in each case the husband, was being remote, cold, um, not spending time with the child at all, and uh, was, in general ways, was uh, failing to be a good father to the son. Both women had tremendous anger, and the marriages were falling apart, and they came to me saying, help me forgive. And uh, the one woman, I, we sat down, we talked about forgiveness. Uh, she actually, in many ways, had a worse situation, but uh, was able to break through and overcome her anger and forgive. The other woman tried and couldn't. Um, and knew it was her Christian duty to forgive her husband, but couldn't. And ironically, the, the woman who forgave her husband, it made it easier for her to communicate with him, because when you're furious with somebody, it's very difficult to do that. And the marriage got better, and the relationships got better, and the son got better. In the other case, the woman who just couldn't control her anger, uh, the marriage fell apart, the son got worse. Looking back, and actually even by her own uh, admission, uh, the, the second woman, the woman who couldn't forgive, had nothing. She said, I have nothing in my life but my son. I have never accomplished anything in my life. I've always felt like if I could just raise this boy to be a, uh, a happy uh, adult who loves me, then I, I'd have meaning in life, which is the very definition of idolatry. And the problem is when your God is dying, you have uncontrollable emotions. You're not just afraid. You're paralyzed with fear. You're not just angry. You're, it's, un, it's uncontrollable anger. And therefore, one of the ways that you can find out whether a good thing has become an ultimate thing is, as my wife says, follow your most uncontrollable emotions down, you know, pull it up and you'll find the roots are usually some kind of idol. So that's what I meant to say, and thanks for giving me a chance to say it. Thank you. Now, there are a number of questions, Tim, which I think understandably say, you've been talking sure. about idols, but how do you know Jesus isn't just another idol and uh, part of our inherent need to worship? That's a good question, I think. Very good question. Um, I said that I was, in a way, working on the personal. I said there's the intellectual reasons to believe, there's personal reasons to believe, and usually social. All together, they make Christianity compelling. What I did was I went after the personal tonight. Uh, I'm assuming that there's a lot of folks out there who find Christianity an interesting idea, but they don't see it's something they need. And I'm trying to show people that everybody does need it. However, if you go down the personal, uh, the intellectual route, you have to get to who Jesus is. If Jesus is who he said he is, uh, he claimed to be the Son of God in a way that the founders of other religions never did. He claimed to be God himself come to earth. And it's claimed that he was raised from the dead. You have to look at that, and that's another whole talk, and that's another whole book. You have to look at that, and if you're convinced of that, then Jesus couldn't be another idol because he would be who he said he is, which is he's God. Uh, even David Foster Wallace, in his confusion, in a sense, said you have to worship a real God or you'll worship a false God. So if he's the real God, then he couldn't be an idol. And that is another whole talk, but that's, that's the direction you'd have to go. Now, we'll say, of course, you could come and hear you on Saturday or presumably read a couple of your books. you deal with that? Well, yeah, I would deal with that uh, in Reason for God. But I, actually, you know, um, John Stott's book, Basic Christianity, uh, really does a wonderful job on that the evidence for the resurrection, looking at the claims of Jesus, and, of, and do, gives a lot more coverage or, to it than I do in my book. Or the New Testament, perhaps? Oh, that. <laughs> Let's move on to the next question. Um, another fair question. You talked about idols disappointing and uh, eating us up. How do we know that God won't, you know, the Christian God, why, how do we know he won't mm. eat us up and disappoint? Well, well that's what... Uh, well, you're right. I think eat up means disappoint. I was just going to say eat you up means either 
Uh, if you achieve it, that is, uh, you actually become as successful as you want it to be, or your children turn out as happily as you want them to turn out, uh, that will at least disappoint. I think what I was trying to say is, gods will disappoint, false gods disappoint if you get them, that you achieve them, and there's not many of us who do, and they will eat you alive, probably, as David Foster Wallace saying, um, uh, since we're trying to live up to certain standards in order to achieve our, our salvation, as it were, most of us feel like we fall short. And that's when the disappointment becomes more than that. It becomes a sense of failure, a sense of uh, meaninglessness. So eat you alive at least means disappoint, and at most means uh, a great deal of self-hatred. The God of the Bible saves by grace, not by works. I tried to say that a couple of times. In fact, I probably will answer another couple of these up here. Can you unpack uh, that? I think yeah, that's you, kind that, of churchy language. What does that yeah, mean? Yeah, it is. You're right. Um, if you, uh, the God of the Bible says, yes, you should live a good life. You should uh, live according to the Ten Commandments. Uh, if you don't, then there's guilt. But every other religion doesn't send a savior. They, all other religions, and I would even say the, the self-made religions that we all come up with, which is the religion of career or family, etc. All those religions essentially say you can feel good about yourself, you can get the blessing if you achieve, if you do well. In biblical religion, God says you should live according to the Ten Commandments. You haven't. You won't. You will fail. And therefore, I have made a provision. And the provision is God himself actually coming to earth in the form of Jesus Christ, paying our debt on the cross, taking the judgment we deserve on the cross. Uh, what that means is that the, the, the biblical God, the God of grace, when you I remember I said at the very end, and it was shorthand, um, if you get him, he won't disappoint because he's the real God. But if you fail him, there's a provision for forgiveness. That, frankly, the musician, the girl who was the musician, uh, she failed to achieve what she wanted to achieve, and there was no atonement. Another way to put it is your career can't die on the cross for your sins. Okay? Your career can't die on the cross for your sins, but Jesus did. And that makes him fundamentally different than any other God. I think you've put there the negative side of it, that is that Jesus took the penalty, the condemnation for mm -hmm. failing. Right. Some of the questions are asking, well, what about Jesus? What makes Jesus so great? What's the positive then in... In, uh, you know, why is he better than all the other idols in following him then? Well, he, um, that's a leading question. But that's fine. I love yep. where you're going. Uh, which one are you? <laughs> what, um, what are the reasons for Jesus? Yeah. Not say Buddhism, or what's special about Jesus? Um, when, when, there's a sense in which the Bible says not only has Jesus taken our condemnation upon himself, so uh, he, he takes our debt, but there's another sense in which we now identify with him. And because we identify with him, we get the privileges to which he is, uh, uh, that he deserves. In fact, there's a place in 2 Corinthians 5.21. Now, this is biblical language, but let me translate. He says, God made him sin who knew no sin, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. What that means is, when it says Jesus Christ became sin, it can't mean that on the cross he actually became a nasty person. He wasn't cursing and getting angry. And you know, No, what it meant was he was treated as if he had done what we had done. So then it, when it says, God made him sin who knew no sin, means he was treated as we deserve, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. And that must mean, by parallelism, that it means that God now loves us and dotes on us and delights in us as if we'd done what Jesus had done. Because in a sense, we take, we get what Jesus deserved, and pardon me, Jesus gets what we deserved, and then we get what he, uh, what Jesus deserved, and that gives uh, a Christian, even when you fail, a sense that I know God loves me because I'm in Christ. And uh, there's a place where John Bunyan, when he first became a Christian, you know, the guy who wrote Pilgrim's Progress, uh, British, I think he was. Uh, he, the the day he really became a Christian was when he was meditating on this, and he realized that uh, in the past he felt like I had a good Tuesday and I did a, had a terrible Wednesday, so God couldn't love me very well on Wednesday. Uh, and then he realized if Christianity is true, he says, God always loves me. And he actually had an illustration. He said, uh, he, he says, I now realize that my performance is, you know, I want to do a good job. I want to love God. 
and I want to do well. But he says, my performance is like the, uh, the, the pocket change a rich man has in his pocket when all of his main wealth is in a trunk at, you know, of gold at home. And he says, my, I have a good Tuesday, I have a bad Wednesday, and I will be unhappy. I'll say, Lord, I want to do better. But my righteousness, you know, my acceptance has been secured by Jesus. There's no, listen, this is why C.S. Lewis at one point said, Christianity should be true because nobody could have thought that up. Uh, it's, it, it, is, uh, it is not just a little different than other religions. It's not like, like, oh, the Buddhists are kind of mystical and the Muslims are more practical. And the, it's nothing like that. It's a complete reversal of what every other religion says. And it's, it's, I think it's wondrous. Tim, I, I, th I used to be a, a lawyer, and I guess there are others here, thinking just because it sounds good doesn't make it true. No, I mean, just to think, you know, that sounds wonderful, but yeah, it doesn't yeah. make it true. So just to come back, where do you start looking on the intellectual level for how do I know if it is true? that he died on the cross in my place, all this good stuff you're talking about. I, I still think the fastest way into the, an, a good understanding of the reasons that Christianity is true is to start with Jesus. Some people would say, logically, you need to decide whether God's there. And I, uh, actually, on, Sunday, on Saturday, that's my job at the, at the convention. I'm supposed to go and talk about why, why I believe in God. I would have to say, however, and people would say, well, I have to believe in God before I can get to Jesus. I actually think, and Richard was very cagey in pointing out, you could always read the New Testament. If you read the accounts of Jesus' life, if you compare his claims with the way in which he lived, uh, when you see how he treats people, I think that there's, uh, and when you certainly look at the evidence for the resurrection, probably looking at Jesus' life and assessing, how can I account for this man's life and how can I account for what happened? Uh, might be the fastest way into a, an understanding of the reasons that Christianity is cogent and makes sense. Because to me, probably the strongest case for the existence of God is the, is the reality of Jesus. Uh, I do think you can start with other ways of thinking about things to say there must be a God, but I still think going to Jesus first is, is the fastest way in. Okay. And if you discovered, let's say for a moment that you discovered it was true that Jesus did die for our sins on the cross, and we got his privileges. Many would then ask, well, that's typical of, the, of you evangelicals. You all cheer and clap. It's, it's marvelous. But where's the, where's the motivation then to be kind to other people? Where's the motivation to actually look after the world yeah. and take responsibility? Mm -hmm. Isn't that an excuse simply for avoiding your responsibilities? Right. Uh, I, the fastest way back, and I'm going to try to be shorter and shorter, so we can get to more questions. Uh, the fastest way to, when people say, if you really feel like, oh my goodness, you know, now you're accepted and God loves you no matter what, what's your incentive for le leading a good, <clears throat> decent, moral, loving life? And I always say, if you're only, if when you get rid of all your fear, when you get rid of all, when you get rid of all your fear of punishment, you've lost all motivation for living a good life, then the only motivation you had for living a good life was fear? There are other motivations. There's gratitude. There's relationship. Um, I, I want, the, the more I respect my wife and the more I, I love my wife, the more I want to please her. And I don't want to please her because I'm afraid she's going to hit me. Um, I want to please her because I just love to see her delighted. And, and uh, I try to say at the very end, Christianity creates a new relationship with God. Uh, if I'm obeying God in order to, that, so I, just, just so he'll reward me, then I'm actually using God. I mean, I'm obeying him as a means to an end, which is going to heaven, let's say. But if I see that God has already procured for me everything at infinite cost to himself through the death of Jesus that I could ever want, now I can obey him just to please him which means he becomes an end in, in, in itself, in himself. He's not a means to some other end, and I think that's more healthy. I'm trying to be short. There's a question here saying, um, if I'm looking for fulfillment, can you really tell me that a relationship with God will give me that? And well, what about doubts? So are you saying mm. that you never have any doubts in this relationship with God? Well, listen, I, I'd like to answer that question two ways. Um, again, <clears throat> everybody, by the way, I'm always told that Americans know C.S. Lewis is way more famous in America than here, so you might be surprised how well I know what he says. There's some place where C.S. Lewis says, if you're going to follow Jesus, 
You should follow him, not because he's relevant, though he is, not because he's fulfilling, though he is, not because he's enjoyable or he'll change your life, though he will, but because he's true, because he actually is who he said he is. And I think we've got to make this very clear. Uh, to start with, usually something goes wrong in your life that shows you you need something besides your own resources to deal with life. So there's a tendency to look for, to God as a kind of giant uh, spiritual cash point window where you're going to get what you need in order to handle your life. But in the process, you better come to see that the only way he will be relevant is if you go to him not because he's relevant, but because he's an end in himself, because he's, he is who he said he is. And, and therefore, in the end, you have to be careful. Don't go, if you go to God for fulfillment, I don't sure you're going to find fulfillment. If you go to God because you've looked at the evidence and you've seen who you are and who he is, and you say, I just should give myself to him because that's the right thing to do, fulfillment will come. Uh, the only other thing I would say is, uh, at a philosophical level, I, I, I believe the, 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 about doubts, excuse me. At the philosophical level, I, I think the philosophers are right. In, there is no absolute empirical certainty of anything. So I, we can't be sure that we're, both, we're here. Did you ever see The Matrix? <laughs> well, the, the, the first movie, the other two are terrible. But, you know, when you see a movie like that, it's true. You know, this might all be a hallucination. Putting that to a side, at the common sense level, I'm as sure as G, of Jesus as I am of my, that my wife loves me. And I'm pretty sure of that, except there's no way to prove it. Uh, it's a, and yet, at the visceral level, I'm absolutely and totally sure she does. And uh, my relationship with Jesus is about as real as that. Right, let's, so. let's, let's nail you a bit there, because some people will say, yeah, but your wife can give you a hug and a kiss, so where's Jesus? And so you're saying, you know, it's as, you can't know anything, yes, but I'm more well. certain of someone I can see and touch and feel than I am of someone right. who I can't see. So. Right. Well, first of all, did you notice what I said? I actually didn't say, I'm a, I didn't talk about my wife being existing, because I just said, honestly, the philosophers are right. You really can't be sure in a complete, you, there's no absolutely perfect, provable way to prove that your, your, your cognitive faculties work and that empirical sense experience is true. But once you put that to a side and say, okay, yeah, but practically, um, I said that my relationship with my wife, things like love, that sounds terrible to say, you know, maybe she's a sleeper spy. And uh, she is, you know, if for some reason she's supposed to kill me at the age of 65. <laughs> And uh, she came from some foreign government. And I mean, I have no proof that that couldn't be. So, I mean, that's what makes me, when people say, well, you can be sure about your wife, but how can you be sure about Jesus? I say, well, if you want to get philosophical, you can't be sure about anything. But if you want to get down to the common sense, my experience of Jesus through the word, uh, the, thing, the changes he's made in my life, my rational and uh, my, my intellectual uh, uh, looking at things like the resurrection of Jesus, when you put it, uh, the intellectual, the rational, the experiential all together brings about a certainty and it's cumulative and it takes time. I can give you one other illustration. If, if, uh, if let's just say I was supposed to hire a, a new PA and I had five or six... You mean sound system or a yeah. secretary? Um, no, physician's assistant, no, I'm kidding. Right, okay, yeah. There's a lot of PAs. Yeah, or yeah. Pennsylvania, PA is also Pennsylvania, no, a, a secretary. Right. Five or six people uh, uh, apply. I could, uh, I, I could interview them all, I could look at the references, I could do all kinds of due diligence, but I can only get to the place where intellectually I know that probably this one is the right one. I could not possibly get to certainty before I hire. So to hire means I have to open myself. It's, you become vulnerable. You know, if you make a bad hire, it's a mess. Uh, and therefore, there, but there's no way I can be totally certain before I hire the person. So I can, I can think myself to the point of probability, but I have to commit myself personally to get to certainty. And after a year, I'll know. I guess that's how relationships work, isn't it? Yes, and it, it's really no different with, with Christ. So you, you really can't get yourself all the way to some kind of intellectual certainty before you, before you uh, commit. Okay, now you've mentioned a few times, there's a question here, which I'm lead, leading to, towards. You've mentioned the Word, the Gospels, the New Testament. There's a question here, doesn't Paul skew the message of Jesus? And I think that's a common question, that people feel that the New Testament 
might be misrepresenting mm-hmm. the original Jesus. What were your comments on that? Well, the short answer is, after 40 years of studying it, I, I see complete alignment between Jesus and Paul. But I, I think it's fair t- to say um, that the hard work of interpreting the Bible is something that you do have to do. I, I mean, I've had people say to me, let me give you a quick example. Somebody said, well, if I believe the whole Bible, I'd have to believe in polygamy. And all I want to say to a person like that is, let's, just, let's, let's talk about Jesus, let's look at who he is first, and let's leave all the other parts out for a moment. Let's look at him. And I say, but, but don't you believe the Bible teaches polygamy? And I, what I usually say is, well, where do you get that? And they say, well, look at Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, they all had wives. I said, look, you read the book of Genesis and you'll see that every single polygamous family that the Bible depicts is an absolute disaster. So if you think think the purpose of the writer of Genesis is to uh, promote polygamy, you do not know how to read. (laughs) But what that is, is that's interpretation. So I said, I don't want to go there. I don't, I mean, after this, you could bring up Jonah and the whale, you could bring up Paul's view of women, you could bring up all kinds of things and say, what about this? And you will never go down, you'll never chase all those rabbits down those trails before you. The best thing to do is go to the Gospels, go to Jesus, decide if he is who he said he is, then you can go to the rest of the Bible after that. And, and very often Jesus' words help you interpret the rest of the scripture. Okay. Let's come back then to the motive to actually explore Jesus in the, in the New Testament. Uh, what if someone here is saying, okay, I just don't care. I just don't care. Uh, you know, my life seems okay, I'm managing, you're talking about all these idols, I don't care. Well, you know what, I would have to say then park what I've said tonight. D- just don't totally forget it. Uh, you might smirk a little bit at what I, because David Foster Wallace says, if you don't see yet that you've got a problem, unless you've got a real God in the center of your life, maybe someday later you will. I'm just saying park the idea, the concept, I can't, uh, I certainly can't create conviction in you tonight, but don't forget what I said, and maybe sometime in the future you'll remember. I don't, there's no way I can push you uh, past that, but I did my best tonight to try to get you to think that, gee, maybe I actually do need something besides just, maybe I do need something outside of my own resources. So my whole point was to try to get you to care, <laughs> but uh, if you don't tonight, just try to remember, and maybe someday in the future it'll be relevant. So is it just a question of uh, trying to well, you were waiting till the idols that we're serving eventually disappoint and eat us up. Well, I'm old enough now that I've, um, I've, I've seen a lot of situations in which I've talked to somebody and uh, years go by before people come back and say, some of those things I thought about and I'm beginning to see that maybe they were right. So, yes, I guess I'm saying that it, uh, very often t- the time is later. I, I can't force you. To, I mean, I, I can't open a person's heart. I can just give, them, give you the idea. That's all. And the other side of this, what about those of us here who thought, actually, I do care? You've said some things tonight about things that have failed. I guess there are many of us here thinking, I have pursued those things, and they are disappointing. What next? What do I do next? I'm afraid there's too, there's too many different answers to that, because I'd, if I was sitting down with you as one-on-one, I would want to know where your, what are the missing pieces, and I'm afraid everybody's are different. I would say, right, at this church or some other church, if there are the sort of traditional courses, there's a good number of the various courses where it says explore Christianity more. Uh, in five weeks or four weeks or six weeks, that's ideal. Just, that's ideal. Usually, uh, it all depends, if, you, if you're doing it with another group of people, that have similar kinds of questions as, you, as that you do, it can be a terrific experience. So, right. I think we've come uh, pretty much to the end of our time. Tim, it's been wonderful to have you with us this evening. And uh, I think we ought to show our appreciation to Tim in the usual way. Thank you very much. <laughs>